9-11 and the dot-com era helped launch something new, the conspiracy theory industrial complex, moving conspiracy theories from the fringes to the mainstream and making them profitable. And here's where things get tricky. Sometimes the conspiracy theory turns out to be true. And some skepticism is key to holding people in power accountable in a democracy. But too much skepticism can lead to a world where, to paraphrase Hannah Arendt, we begin to believe everything and nothing, think that everything is possible and that nothing is true. And if nothing is true, how does a democracy survive? I'm Rand Abdel Fattah. And I'm Ramtin Arab Louis. Coming up, we're going back to the earliest days of the internet to trace how we ended up in a world that can't be believed. Part 3. The truth is the truth. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, has reported the first case in the United States of a new and deadly coronavirus. I remember January 2020 when the first case hit. A resident of Washington state in the Seattle area is infected. The man had traveled to central China to the city of Wuhan where the virus was first discovered. And I remember thinking, please, God, let this be a rich man's disease. Scientists now say humans can transmit the virus to one another. This is going to be about people who travel through airports for a living and wear suits to meetings. It's going to be over there. It's going to burn the coastlines. It's not going to come to us because we're Appalachia. We're rural. We're away. We're reserved. It's, it's going to be okay. This is Wendy Welch, whose books include... COVID-19 Conspiracy Theories, and then Masks, Misinformation, and Making Do. She spoke to us from her home in Wytheville, Virginia. By April, when it was evident that this thing was going to rip through America. From San Jose to Salt Lake to Boston, so-called surge tents popping up. The hospitals in our regions geared up their emergency units ready to catch the patients who were coming with COVID. And the patients didn't come. And we were sitting in our houses going, <laughs> literally, the angel of death is passing us over. Wendy says many people in her community already didn't trust authorities. Appalachia was ground zero of the opioid crisis, a crisis that was manufactured by pharmaceutical companies. One town in rural West Virginia became one of the busiest distribution endpoints for opioids in the country. It is impossible to overestimate the effects of the Oxycontin sellout on medicine in Appalachia. Three major distributors of prescription opiates, McKesson, Cardinal Health, and Amerisource Bergen, made $17 billion sending 423 million opioid painkillers to West Virginia between 2007 and 2012. It is the core of conspiracy thinking to believe that you are part of a group that is marginalized, to believe that you are losing power or never had power in the first place. Also to be part of a group that holds itself slightly apart. If you only understood us better, you would know how awesome we are, is classic conspiracy breeding ground. And into that climate of distrust came COVID. The conspiracy theories started early. Misinformation is spreading fast. There was the one about whether the virus was related to biological weapons research. Was it built in a lab by scientists and unleashed on the masses? Another said that the CDC and Bill Gates were in on it. Do people really believe that stuff? Alex Jones was selling toothpaste, dietary supplements, creams, and several other products, saying they'd kill COVID. Medical conspiracy theory fairly often involves someone who realizes there is, put bluntly, money and power to be made by playing on what people are afraid of or by stoking what angers people. Outrage sells. 
and then it hit us. But by the time COVID hit Wendy's community, the seeds of distrust had already been sown. Those people said, you need this vaccine to keep you and your family safe. And these people said, yeah, that's what she said about Oxy. As the unknown started stacking up and the conspiracy theories started flying, many people were looking to scientists to lead us through the pandemic. But science wasn't certain, and scientists weren't immune to politics. A lot of people know that I'm a natural-born shitster. My stance was, I'm not going to let what politicians say determine what I write. I'm not going to be there calculating the political outcomes of what is scientifically true or not. Like, the truth is the truth. This is Alina Chan. While Wendy was hunkering down in her home in Appalachia, Alina was doing the same thing in her apartment in Boston, asking herself questions that many of us were asking then. Is this serious? What should we do to protect ourselves and our families? Is it safe enough to go back to work? But Alina is a scientist at the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard who specializes in gene therapy and cell engineering. So she was also asking questions about the virus itself. So I started just reading as much as I could about the other closely related coronaviruses like SARS and MERS. And she noticed that COVID-19 was behaving differently. It wasn't mutating very quickly, almost like it was already adapted to humans. I started to worry that this might have come from a lab. And there was another reason she thought this. Wuhan, China, where the first case of COVID was detected, is home to China's premier coronavirus research laboratory. And it was actually scientists from Wuhan who were first sounding the alarm. Scientists in Wuhan actually pointed out that it could have come from the markets, but hey, also look at these labs in our city and... They have been collecting these exactly these type of viruses from these bats, bringing them back to the lab. But right away, the Chinese government rejected the idea of a lab leak. And while all this confusion was happening about how bad it was going to get and where it came from and how to stop it, the political rhetoric in the U.S. was also heating up. So many of America's elites are so uh, committed to propping up the Chinese Communist This is the Wuhan coronavirus. As the Trump administration and right-wing politicians consistently blame China for the virus, it was leading to real violence against Asian and Asian-American communities in the U.S. Meanwhile, U.S. investigators were focused on the theory that the virus had jumped to humans from an animal market. Top virologists had also stepped into the game. We stand together to strongly condemn conspiracy theories suggesting that COVID-19 does not have a natural origin. This is a letter co-signed in the medical journal The Lancet by more than two dozen scientists. Given how politicized COVID was becoming, they felt the need to weigh in with clear information. And they lumped the lab leak theory in with all the other conspiracy theories floating around. Conspiracy theories do nothing but create fear, rumors, and prejudice that jeopardize our global collaboration in the fight against this virus. The letter got a ton of coverage. But in private messages around this time, some scientists wondered if a lab leak actually was possible. I literally swivel day by day thinking it is lab escape or natural. We only know about these messages because they were leaked in 2023. The main issue is that accidental escape is in fact highly likely. It's not some fringe theory. They discussed many concerns in their private messages. One of them was the geopolitical shit show, using their words, <laughs> not mine. Nobody wanted to be blamed for a virus that was killing millions and millions of people. Here we should mention that the U.S. funded and supported projects coming from the Wuhan lab. If the lab was at fault for leaking the virus, the U.S. would also likely have to answer. But Alina says she wasn't focused on the politics. She was convinced that a lab leak in Wuhan was plausible. And she felt like it was important to investigate all plausible scenarios. So she took what others had said privately and went public. There's presently 
little evidence to definitively support any particular scenario of SARS-CoV-2 adaptation. In a paper, which she also tweeted about, she questioned why the virus seemed to be mutating slowly. Even the possibility that a non-genetically engineered precursor could have adapted to humans while being studied in a laboratory should be considered, regardless of how likely or unlikely. So it's that very last statement that got me into a lot of trouble. Suddenly, she was getting hate mail from some people who thought she was spreading a conspiracy theory and from others who didn't think she was taking her theory far enough and from scientists who thought she was damaging the integrity of science. You know, I I could have stepped back at any time. I could have completely deleted my online presence and and gone into hiding. But I, I was just like, I'm not ashamed of my scientific analysis. I'm not ashamed of what I wrote because it's true. Over time, the U.S. government and science community have come around to the plausibility of a lab leak. In 2021, President Biden asked the U.S. intelligence community to investigate the two leading theories again. Today, institutions including the World Health Organization, intelligence agencies, and some media outlets characterize the lab leak as plausible. For me, I've gone all the way from in early 2020 being cast as an anti-science conspiracy theorist to, to now a lot of people do see me as some sort of shining example of scientific integrity. COVID was a crisis, and people needed to take rapid action to prevent its spread. Some scientists believed simplifying the narrative was the way to do that. But Alina thinks a show of certainty was the wrong move. It's better to acknowledge mistakes and learn from them rather than pretend that you're infallible or or to curate it so much to the point where you're only saying half-truths all the time. So I I think sometimes that can be a a fatal flaw of a lot of public communication to simplify to the point of making something untrue or or to, to say things so confidently that they fail to convey uncertainty. Sometimes it's refreshing just to hear from experts we don't know yet, but these are the things we're going to do to find out what's happening. Because then in the future, people won't trust you anymore and they won't trust the system, which bodes even more ill for the next crisis. The time to build alliances, the time to build trust, the time to build friendships is before you need them. The limits of conspiracy thinking are being challenged today by individuals like Alina and people who have been targets of conspiracy theories like the families of the Sandy Hook shooting victims, who after years of fighting Alex Jones in court, finally won nearly $1.5 billion in damages. And maybe more significant, after years of calling the mass shooting a hoax, in 2022, Jones admitted that it was, quote, 100% real. Alex Jones' stunning admission came during a contentious cross-examination. It's 100% real finally conceding the Sandy Hook school shooting did happen. We reached out to Alex Jones for comment on this episode, but did not receive a response back. This was a moment where the truth broke through all the noise. And yet, not all conspiracy thinking is this obvious. But it feels like a big win in a world where we all have to wade through this conspiracy theory industrial complex and increasingly, AI algorithms that fill our feeds, blurring the lines even more. The question is, is the truth enough? The collapse of faith and trust in institutions has so permeated civic life and public life uh, and, and politics in America today. There's sort of a chunk of the American people who will sort of never believe again the things that they are being told in the media. And that American politics in too many ways has become completely unmoored from the basic facts and the sort of small t truths that are necessary for a society to agree upon in order for a democracy to function. If we give up our belief that truth matters, everything is up for grabs. And that has major consequences. In some cases, life and death, 
who are we if we don't believe that we should tell the truth to each other and we don't hold our leaders accountable for telling the truth to us? Who are we? I'm Randa Abdel Fattah. And I'm Ramtin Arab Louis. This episode was produced by me. And me and Lawrence Wu. Julie Kane. Anya Steinberg. Casey Miner. Christina Kim. Devin Kadiyama. Sarah Wyman. Ying Tai. Kiana Pakliwan. Rachel Horowitz. Lena Muhammad. Irene Noguchi. Fact checking for this episode was done by Kevin Vocal. This episode was mixed by Robert Rodriguez. Thank you to Johannes Durgi. Shannon Bond, Brett Neely, Tony Cavan, Barclay Walsh, Albert Jung, and Puneet Matiwala. And special thanks to Casey Miner, Devin Katayama, Ali Katayama, and Anya Steinberg for their voiceover work. Music for this episode was composed by Ramtin and his band, Drop Electric, which includes Anya Mizani, Naveed Marvi, Sho Fujiwara. Thanks for listening. <laughs>